So as we are in this series of living the good life, I think one of the most challenging things to living the good life is that sometimes there's things that happen in our life that just aren't so good. We live in a culture right now where the Me Too movement and Time's Up has been elevated to the conversation as people are discussing what sexual abuse and sexual assault looks like. When finally women are being heard, and not just women but also men, who have found themselves abused. I found these fascinating statistics and also quite heartbreaking this week that one in three girls before they're 18 have experienced some form of sexual abuse or sexual assault and that three in seven boys have before the age of 18. It's a staggering number. It's heartbreaking. And I read, heard read in our text this morning that to not exchange abuse for abuse but instead to extend a blessing instead of abuse. I think in our culture and where we live today, that's a hard thing to hear. And I think sometimes in some of our ears, we may even hear that and go, so does that mean we just like let the abusers go and we just try to lavish good blessings on them and hope that somehow that will change their ways? Do we just sit back passively and allow these abuse to occur in our culture? What do we do? What does it mean to to be a blessing to somebody who's an abuser and has hurt you? Our passage today, it talks about what it means to not meet an insult for an insult. We live in a culture and in a world where it seems that Twitter is the purpose of insults now. Where the people, the highest people in our land are senators and our congressmen and our teachers and our leaders who we're supposed to be looked to seem to be caught up in these childhood middle school fights back and forth with a few characters of insults that they can spew at one another. I mean, these are the people that we're supposed to be looking to as examples, as the people who are our leaders. Yet insult for insult seems to be what is spewed back and forth. Yet it seems to me that we live in a world that if there is evil in the world, we try to match it with just the same amount of evil and violence to show them that we have big guns, don't mess with us, step down. We live in a world where oftentimes it is not raised up the idea to be humble as good and to be tender-hearted, and to be sympathetic. Instead, what seems to be a value is those who stand for what they believe in and are proud and are prideful and are sure and certain and unwilling to hear or budge, and they stand their ground. We live in a world in many ways where those who think differently than us, we refuse to hear their viewpoints or to reach across party lines for fear of being associated with those people or those people. Yet in our passage today in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter is calling us to something that I believe the Spirit is still calling us and moving us to today. To be a people who don't respond with insult for insult, evil for evil, abuse for abuse. We would be a people who are tender-hearted and humble in our attitude. That we would be quick to forgive and extend love and compassion I have heard this story recently of about, uh, in June of 1996, there was a group of KKK white supremacists who had decided that they were going to gather outside of City Hall in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so, with all protests, they had to gain a petition to do so, and a permit. And so they went to the office and they got their approval. Well, then the word got out amongst town that the KKK were coming to Ann Arbor outside of the city hall to protest. And so, counter-protesters decided to begin to organize. And on the day of the protest, there were 17 KKK members who showed up outside of city hall and 300 counter-protesters. As the white supremacists began to spew out their beliefs and their thoughts and their hatred, insults, and evil... All of a sudden, how many of you know that the, that, that the counter-protesters sort of pushed in a little bit? And all of a sudden, a little bit, you've got a, a shoulder that's bumping and all of a sudden, a word that's spewing and all of a sudden, somebody says something and you feel you have to bounce back at them and, and match what they're saying and you're, what, you're, what their presence is is becoming more intensified. How many of you know if there's only 17 of one and 300 of another, you feel a little intimidated and nervous about where this is going? And before you knew it, all of a sudden, two of the protesters began to fight at it and the whole group broke out. It didn't take long before one of them was knocked to the ground, one of the white supremacists. 
And as he was knocked to the ground, a bunch of the counter-protesters around began to kick and hit and punch and spit and pick up rocks and throw it at the KKK member. And then there's this image I want to share with you. One of the counter-protesters named Kaisha jumped on top of the KKK member as people were beating and trying to hurt him. And she said, stop. There's a better way. Stop. This girl was there counter-protesting men who were there to talk evils about her and tell her that she was inferior to them. To tell her that she didn't belong in this country. To tell her that she needed to find her place. Yet, even though they spewed insult and evil and anger and hatred, at the moment that violence erupted upon him, she threw her own body, not just her words, on top of him to guard and protect him and shield him from the blows of the counter-protesters. I'm not saying counter-protesters weren't justified in their anger. It's a righteous anger. But I think that when we resort to violence, I think we sin in our anger then. Kaisha got it. She understood what that meant. To not respond with evil with more evil. That it only escalates the evil. Today in our passage here in 1 Peter chapter 3, it seems that Peter seems to understand this. And Peter doesn't just tell us things not to do. Peter actually tells us what to also do. And I'm grateful for that. Amen? So this is what Peter says. He says in verse 11, he says, Search for peace and work to maintain it. So I, I realize that in the room this size, the reality is that some of us have probably experienced some form of abuse, whether that's emotional abuse or physical abuse or sexual abuse. Or perhaps uh, that, that, that abuse looked like when we were in school, maybe we were bullied and made fun of. Or perhaps it was a parent who just continually degraded us and took us down and weren't there for us. Or perhaps it was a spouse where things got emotionally or physically abusive. Or perhaps it was a person within our own family that broke that power and that trust that we had and they abused us in some way. Whatever that may look like, many of us in some way have experienced the pains of what it looks like to be hurt and for the acts of evil. Some of us in this room, maybe racial comments have been said about us, or perhaps some of us uh, who are women in the room, maybe, maybe you have experienced what it looks like to, to be discriminated against and to be told or looked over for a job or for a workplace, or I don't know what it is for you, but maybe you've experienced some form of evil, or, or maybe someone in your family doesn't agree with you being a Christian and a follower of Jesus, and you've experienced some form of discrimination in that way, and you've had to figure out how to respond in a way that wasn't judgmental or hurtful. Maybe some of you have experienced ageism and people who have assumed certain things about you because you reached a certain age that you can't do certain things or your best days are behind you. And maybe you've experienced that. I don't know what it is, but all of us have experienced some form of evil, some form of hatred, some form of discrimination and pain, and we've had to ask ourselves, how will I respond to this moment? Well, we must search for peace and work to maintain it. Well, how do you do that? Well, I found another story that I thought was quite interesting. Ellen DeGeneres had uh, this first grader on her television show. It's a first grader named Danny, and he shared a story about when he was in first grade, he was bullied by some of his classmates because of his speech impediment and because he loved to wear suits, man after my own heart. And he would wear a suit every day to school. I'm going to let you know, I wore a suit to school a lot when I was a little kid uh, and in, even in high school. And I got some flack for it, so Danny has my heart here, I understand. Now, Danny, also one of the things that he loved to do was uh, he loved to be the water coach for the fifth grade football team. He loved football, but was too scared to get out there and play. But this was the closest he could get to it and still be a part of a team. And so, when the fifth grade football team had heard that their water coach was being bullied, they decided, we've got to do something about this. The first graders can't think that it's acceptable to make fun of somebody just because they wear a suit or they have a speech impediment. So, they decided that they were going to devise a plan. And their plan was this, that there would be one day that year they would, they would have a Danny Appreciation Day where everyone in the fifth grade would wear a suit to school. And that some of those fifth graders on the playground would actually walk around with Danny. And if anybody said anything to him, and which some people did, they would explain to the first graders why it wasn't cool to make fun of people. And why it was actually cool to think that it's awesome that people wear different clothes from different cultures and styles and backgrounds. 
And for somehow, some way, because first graders look up to fifth graders for some reason, it changed the culture in that class. And first graders realized, oh, this isn't a cool thing to do. And Danny wasn't teased anymore. I think this is a beautiful story of, of uh, my parents would have told me when I was a kid, if someone punches you, punch back harder. If someone teases you, give a worse insult and they'll stop. Or my grandma would say, just, just ignore them. You know, they don't know what they're talking about. They're just hurt people who are hurting people and it's fine and, 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 and just walk away. And as I've gotten a little older, I, I understand the sentiment, but I, I have to ask myself the question, why is it that when it comes to emotional abuse, we just want us to tell people to just suck it up and deal with it, but if it's physical or sexual abuse or assault, all of a sudden, we need to do something about it. I want you to know, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words, they also hurt you. I hope you know that. Whether it's physical or emotional or sexual abuse or assault, evil is evil in all of its forms and it's unacceptable and needs to be addressed and taken all just as seriously. I remember thinking about this story and thinking, you know, the, the, these people, uh, uh, these, these fifth graders who heard about this act of evil that was happening, in many ways this, this first grader was defenseless in being able to even fight back. And instead of just saying, well, just ignore them or just throw a punch or just walk away, the fifth grader said, no, we need to do something to change the systemic issue that lies here. Something in the first graders in our school think that it's okay to tease somebody. And so they, here's this picture you have of uh, the first grader with all the fifth graders around him on the day that they all wore their suit. And the, I, I love this image because it's a, it's a reminder to me that this is what it looks like to search for peace and not just to bless your enemy and not just to sort of turn the other cheek and walk away and allow this behavior to continue. But no, God actually calls us to change that which is evil in the world, to call people to a different way, to bring people together, to tear down the walls that divide us and the anger that is in our hearts. And they rallied around this young man and they said, no, we're going to search for peace and we're going to work to maintain it. And so every year at this school, they have times when the upperclassmen will have uh, rallies and they'll talk about bullying and why it's not cool with their hopes to influence the underclassmen because they're working to maintain the resistance of evil in the world. You see, our, those in our passage this morning uh, who Peter is writing to, uh, they in many ways fought uh, their own sort of challenges. They we're not considered like a Christian faith yet at this point in history. They would have been considered like a, sub a subgroup of Judaism. And many of those within, the, within Judaism and, and all, as well as Gentiles did not like that there was this new form of Judaism seeming to be formed. That there were these rebels and these people who were following the ways of Jesus. They, they didn't appreciate that. They were breaking the norms and what was acceptable. And so for many of these people, as they converted, their families turned their backs on them. For many of these folks, they wanted to maintain the status quo and they were afraid that, that these new Christians, sort of speak, they were part of the new Judeo-Christianity, that they would stir and they would break up and they would create tension for the Romans and that it would make life difficult for them and they did not want that. And we know through history that that is exactly what eventually happened. And throughout Rome, there were times when Christians were in power and they had total control and sometimes they persecuted and oppressed those who didn't believe like them. And there were other times when Christians were not in power and they were the minority and they were the ones being persecuted. It's funny how that happens with power when you get it and you realize what it was like to be on the other side. Sometimes you do the very same things that were done to you to maintain the power. Mm. Yet that's not at all what God called us to. Mm. To not fight with the same weapons that were used to oppress us, that are used to abuse and hurt us, but instead to honor, love, and respect I wonder how different history would have been throughout church history if when Christians got power, they didn't use it to cause other people to live in line with their beliefs, but instead allowed space for the diversity of thought and opinions as they wish they had had when they were persecuted. I think that is what Peter was calling them to here. And I think that's what Peter is still calling us to today. To live in a world where persecution and evil, where divisions don't exist in the same way. As we close with this message this morning, I want us to consider something. It's September, and every year in September, the thing that comes immediately on my radar is September 11, 2001. It just sort of forces me to think about it. 
And I found this story of a United Methodist church that just a few months after the attacks on 9-11, they decided that they needed to, to figure out how to rally people together for unity and not division. They were sensing in the media that there was these great divides and hatred beginning to be formed against Islam and people from the Middle East in general, and they realized that this was not going to help the gathering together and the uniting of our country if we began to demonize certain people groups for the actions of some of the extremists in some of them. And so they decided there's got to be a way we've got to come together. We have to keep the conversation going. We have to keep reaching across the lines. We have to continue to build our communities. We have to continue to work for peace and work to maintain it. And so they decided what they were going to do is for Thanksgiving that year, instead of just having their annual Thanksgiving gathering where everybody in the church would come together, they would do it different this year. And so the United Methodist Church of St. Paul's and St. Andrew's decided to host an event called the Peace Feast. And they invited 50 Christians, 50 Muslims, and 50 Jews to all come and to have a meal together. And they decided that at this meal that they needed to make sure that there needed to be a Jew and a Muslim and a Christian at every table. You may have a few more of each because obviously there's more than three people at a table, but there needed to be diversity at every table. And so as people began to gather uh, the pastor of the Methodist church said that it was so funny to him to hear people stand up and say, we need another Jew over here. We need a Muslim over here. We need one of those Christians over here. At a time when the culture was so tense and tight around this topic, after these, just a few months after these attacks had occurred, they were laughing and they were together and they were getting to know one another and understanding one another's faith and then standing up during the dinner from each member of their faith, they read passages from their holy books about searching for peace and working to maintain it. And this was an example, this was a beacon for us of what it looks like to not just bless our enemy, to not just passively to ignore it or to retaliate with another punch, to not just let our abusers off, but to allow them to be held accountable so that reconciliation and healing can be made, so that our abusers and those who've done evil can see the hurt they have caused, repent from it, and reconciliation and peace can be made possible and our world can be made more whole and people can understand the evil that they have done. Stop, repent, and peace be restored. That was the purpose of that meal. That was the purpose of, her th of Kaisha throwing her body on top of the KKK member. That was the purpose of this class rising up to defend this defenseless first grader. It was that people may see the evil that they have done and that they may repent and that peace may come and reconciliation may be possible. Why? So that we can see God's kingdom come to earth. Why? So that we can see that through Christ, through love, through reconciliation, peace, peace is possible. As we go back into this world, may we be the light and the peace of Christ to the world. May all we do, may we search for peace and may we work to maintain it. Go in peace and know the Lord.